All right, ladies and gentlemen. So obviously in the last uh, video, uh, we looked at the uh, politics of the Third uh, French Republic. Uh, we're going to go across the English Channel now and take a peek at uh, Victorian England and kind of see how their politics are going in this world of mass politics we're going to find. So don't forget, remember, if you want to look at um, you know Britain at this time, they had this huge prosperous period with all this economic stuff happening. It was just poof, exponential growth. And um, with all the things they had, you know, from shipbuilding and going to iron and steel ships and railroads all over the place, all the fort holdings that Britain had, they had this huge trade monopoly and they're making all kinds of money. But you know what they say? Money doesn't necessarily buy you happiness. And people were still very unhappy in Great Britain. Uh, because of different political issues that are going down. Now, I understand there's a thing called the Victorian compromise that existed, okay? And so essentially, um, you know, Whigs and Tories are the two parties, all right? So you have the conservatives and the liberals. So the Tories are called the conservatives, liberals are called the Whigs. And this Victorian compromise that existed in different um, views and stuff was essentially this deal that these two parties were let stuff go just as long as... Um, you know, things happen, right? I mean, honestly, for a very long time, you couldn't really tell the difference between who these people were, how they actually worked. Um, it was really kind of weird. Um, and as Victorian Commonwealth said, is as we got richer and richer and richer and richer and richer, you know, certain people, and we had more industrial power, certain people got richer. Also, as industrial power, certain people got richer, another class got poorer and got kind of left behind. And that Commonwealth kind of said that that's okay. You know what I mean? We're going to take that expansion, we're going to take that economic growth. And it's okay that some people get left behind. And by 1860s, though, this middle class that has grown in the middle of this, you know, group, we have this kind of middle group now. We're like, you know what? We want to expand. We want more franchise. The poor, they didn't really want franchise yet. They didn't want to have voting powers yet. They didn't need it. Okay. Uh, but the 1860s, that, that rich group, same deal. They already had it. That middle group is one who wants to vote. And it's going to cause this big split in, in Great Britain. So the Tories and the Whigs, they start going at each other. And it's under... Their, their leadership. So you have Benjamin Disraeli, who is the Tory leader, conservative leader, and William Gladstone, the the more liberal leader. And here you see the two gentlemen that we have here, uh, Gladstone being here looking all stuffy with his awesome mutton chops, uh, Disraeli with the awesome hat and nice little goatee going on here. Um, and they serve as prime, as prime minister over these years. I understand in British Parliament, they have two parties, essentially, okay, the, the Lib Tories and the Whigs, right? Um and prime minister is chose by what party is currently in charge of the house. So if the liberals are in charge, okay, then they pick a prime minister. Conservatives in charge, they pick a prime minister. If the vote switches the party party uh, alliances, new prime minister happens. So you can be prime minister over a lot of different times. So Disraeli is prime minister twice, Gladstone prime minister four different times uh, over the over their period. So. Let's talk about the second reform. Remember that first reform moved back in 1833, try to add more uh, franchise, more voting power to the populace, okay? In 1866, Gladstone, okay, being rich, remember he is our more liberal guy, right? Uh, issues this very moderate reform bill that, uh, you know, didn't really pass the conservatives, okay? A year later, Disraeli, okay, who remember is our more conservative person, okay? He uh, does a more... Um, Radical bill has passed with a lot of liberal support. So obviously these things really don't make sense of how they work out. But the, the basic idea here is that they, they wanted the conservative party to have process, to have the control of the process. The question is, whichever party, the conservatives or liberals, have control, that's how the whole idea of, of, of voting and franchise will happen going forward. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of playing real politic here a little bit in terms of, listen, you know, this labor group, the middle class, if they get the right to vote, Yes, they're going to vote for now. That's right, conservatives. They're trying to play that whole deal off. And as they pitch this bill, and this kind of real politic action happening here, um, they increased the franchise of almost a million people in England. It's almost 88%. And so male householders and lodgers, okay, people who don't own homes, right, paying at least 10 pounds for a room or their rent, got to vote. And those rotten boroughs, when you have a, a little village being represented as like no way there, got rid of a lot of those. And they actually started pouring more and more re uh, representation to these big cities, these big industrial cities like Manchester and Liverpool that have been whole, wholly unrepresented, especially because of that working class. Now, this Victorian compromise is done. 
Now we're start seeing uh, groups argue for help for the middle class, help for the lower class, help for the working class. This idea of, yeah, we're going to get rich and expand and great, and one person is going to be successful, and that person is not going to be successful, is not going to go anymore. That compromise will not go forward. And so you can see an example here in terms of what they want. Obviously, see the word suffrage up here, the Magna Charta, the Charters. They make deal. So just quick introduction to our guys here. Here's Disraeli, um, who was, I love this terminology, a dandy and a romance novelist. He wasn't truly a, um, a you know, a, a politician at heart, you know what I mean? But one of the big things that he also unique is that he is one of the only prime ministers of Jewish parentage. And remember, he couldn't necessarily be in politics with Anglican. So he was actually baptized Anglican to make sure he can have a chance in politics and that kind of stuff. Um Greatly have respect by Queen Victoria, and they were pretty tight uh, in terms of his advisorship to her, all that kind of stuff. And as we're going to our next unit on imperialism, I understand that Disraeli was really the big, strong imperialist. He wanted to see England be an imperialist nation, and he he pushed this greater England policy. We'll talk about a lot when we get into class, into the next week about how England needs to expand its borders, become more industrial, more an imperial country. Whereas Gladstone, who was this you know career long politician known for these big huge speeches and being preached and all kind of stuff, uh, was um, you know really known for these you know people driven liberal type speeches about constitutions and right to vote and all that kind of thing, and so that's where where he his belief is all comes down to. But he was a little England policy. He said, listen. Instead of taking over more lands and having more problems, let's take care of the issue we have right across uh, the sea, that being Ireland. And you want to try and figure out how to take care of the Ireland issue in terms of how, how is Ireland and the UK going to get along? Are they part of the United Kingdom? Are they their own country? Where are they? How are they? All that kind of stuff is part of it. And so that's kind of where we see that issue take place. Now, let's look at Glass's first ministry, his first time, and he really tries to take down the public spending and try to rein in all these things. So a lot of reform laws prevent a lot of people from trying to, you know, make, you know, people uh, to, uh, you know, protect themselves. I mean, he doesn't want to have the privilege. He wants to kind of the, the general kind of thing go, and he wants to help dem uh, democracy education. So as we start, um, you know, expanding our voting populace, he's like, listen, we need smart vote. We can't have dumb people voting for people. Uh, for their leadership, we need to make sure we have smart, intelligent people. So, really, a lot of education is per, is uh, is thought about to make sure we have an educated voting base. Also, trying to promote peace. Uh, you know, you want to really, you know, reduce Spain taxation, try to get more and more trade, low tariffs, so countries will play with us with Britain and make sure things will go. Um, he also kind of combined politics and morality. So, obviously, looking about you know politics in Machiavelli, not being the most moral people. Oh, whereas you have, um, you know, by Bismarck, meant the most moral of decisions. He said, you know, all politics questions are a moral question. We're not going to do things that are immoral uh, to our allies. Um, a lot of cool accomplishments. I mean, army reform. He got rid of flogging in the peacetime. Now, flogging was their punishment, okay, for doing things wrong. Got rid of that. Uh, he got rid of this Establishment Act, which said Irish Catholics did not, did not, pay, did not, not pay taxes to support the Anglican Church in England. So, obviously, the idea that if you're a Catholic, you don't pay tax to support the Anglican Church. That's kind of a big deal, right? The Education Act. All Welsh and English children, notice not Irish, notice that, okay, between 5 and 13 years had to be in school. Hey, that means kind of child labor, doesn't it? The Irish Land Act, saying that if you are not in Ireland taking care of your land or watching as your as your land work by these tenant farmers, you can't just kick them off in 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 for no reason. University Test Act that if you are a non Anglican, you can still attend British University. So these are huge opening up and expanding the idea of education and opportunity to a lot of people. Um, ballots, the secret ballot is a big deal. Otherwise, ballots are watched by your neighbors. I mean, a lot, a lot of things here. Okay. Um, you know, come down as we see different things. They restructured the courts. Civil service exams were, were introduced. So yeah, you have nepotism and problems like that in terms of giving jobs in government. Man, a lot of reforms are very, very liberal type reforms. Here are the domestic policy. So, um, you know, looking at minimum housing standards that you can't have uh, certain housing codes, right? Public health, making sure you have good sewer systems that eventually cross with the you know, the, the wells and create cholera, whatever. They have a Pure Food and Drug Act 25, 30 years before the United States does. Um, you know, Climbing Boys Act. So swimming, uh, chimney sweeping is a very, very dangerous job. They had, had little kids climb into the chimneys and clean them out. And a lot of times these kids might die because of it. They said that if you're 
only kind of chimney sweep we have is an adult chimney sweep, nobody else. Um, Conspiracy Protection and Pro- uh, Property Act. They allowed picketing, picketing being strikes and protests. Otherwise, that was illegal before this. So I'll have huge, huge things happen with education and the Employee Workman Act where they can sue employers in court, requiring education. Wow, there's a lot of crazy things that are happening in terms of Disraeli's, um, you know, his, his second ministry. Now, eventually, the Israeli party gets kicked out of office, and we have Gladstone back again. So we're going to see a shift again to how things work. So we're going to see this reform bill that agricultural laborers, okay, if people working on farms, get franchised and the right to vote. So all of a sudden now, we have 6 million people who can now vote in elections. We're going to see a change again, right? And they take all the seats in parliament and redistribute them to making sure that they're geographically represented better, kind of like we see here in the United States. Uh, the biggest thing, that's the biggest thing I have there, and that's kind of that more and more people getting a chance to vote in Britain. Now, when you have Gladstone's last two ministries, his third and fourth, comes the Irish question. We'll talk about the Irish question a little bit, a lot more, um, you know, probably in the 20th century. We get to the 20th century stuff after spring break. Uh, but he introduced the idea of Irish home rule, this being the idea that Ireland can have their own parliament deal with some issues at home by themselves. Um, and this is a very big deal because right now all the rules of Ireland are being made in London. And so when uh, he pushes this whole deal, liberals are like, eh, I don't know about that, right? Liberals are all about, you know, money and trying to make, you know, the economic decision. Liberals actually split and voted Glass out of his job. He later gets the prime minister back again uh, about six years later and reintroduces home rule again in 1893, where he says Irish parliament, all kind of stuff. This does not mean independence, though. They never wanted to really have you know, an, an independent Ireland. It's still a colony, you will, of, of United Kingdom. Or part of the United Kingdom, but there's no, you know, being ruled and decisions being made in London. Uh, if they want to make the decisions, you know, be made in Ireland versus in London, where uh, they have more home rule decision on certain domestic issues, not all, but some domestic issues. It passes the Commons, rejected by the Lords. We're seeing a thing that Ire- the UK and England doesn't want to let go of Ireland. They don't want to give them their own rule. And this is kind of adding to that fueling fire we're going to see in the 20th century as Ireland tries to break away from the UK. And they had a huge debate about this in terms of where was Ireland rolling. Obviously, we saw with the uh, Irish potato famine and all the stuff happening in Ireland with trying to grow food for Great Britain. It'll be a very, very touchy subject for a time to come. The other thing that's happening is the suffragette movement. Notice so far that the only people get, being given the right to vote are men. And so at this point, yeah, women do have the right to vote. And we're going to see um, Emily, Emily Pankhurst and other women become the big pushers of a woman's right to vote and women's suffrage in Great Britain. Now, they're very, very, you know, part of this. And Emily P- Pankhurst, who lives from, uh, you know, long life, 1858 to 1928, gets really involved in the late 19th, early 20th century, where, you know, women get militant, you know, tie themselves to places, chain themselves, picketing. Uh, one woman actually jumps in a horse race and is killed by the king's horse to prove a point. Uh, women are arrested. They're imprisoned. We see the idea of hunger strikes start in prisons to get rights and the idea of force feeding where women may basically have a tube shoved on their throat and raw eggs put on their, into their bellies to, uh, you know, make them eat and kind of go around the force feedings. Long story short, Emily Pinker is a big organizer. As we'll talk about her more in class a little bit. Uh, but really, there's this with women's party is founded and trying to get the idea of equal pay for equal work, uh, marriage, divorce laws, right to vote, all those kind of things people are pushing for. Uh, for women. Um, even things that you're talking about, we are talking about today yet, yeah, the idea of you know, equal opportunities of rights and public service in terms of jobs, and it should be equal numbers of women in, in, in office, and um, you know, especially because there were no women MPs, and now there are. Uh, maternity benefits, the idea that if you have a baby, should you get some kind of maternity benefit or time off of work to be able to take care of your child? All these questions are being brought up in late and in his century. Um, eventually, it comes to surpass in 1918, what's in the United States does, uh, where women with the right of 30 got the right to vote and all men gained suffrage. So really, we're seeing some big suffrage issues yet even to the 20th century, um, where eventually we have poverty qualifications. And obviously, women with the right of 30 could vote, but 130 still couldn't until 1928, when women with the right of age 21 are allowed to vote, matching the United States. Um, so we eventually see that movement take place and, and help. So the question we're asking you guys in class on Friday, probably going to be this one right here. Who's more democratic being in the 20th century, Britain, Germany, or France? I'm hoping you guys have, a, have an answer for me. Um, all I know is that the answer for sure is not Russia. So thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to help me out here. And uh, you guys have yourselves a wonderful day.